Okay, now we're ready for our next installment of mixed models. So today I'm going to be focusing on software differences in the estimation of two-stage models. So I'm primarily focusing on FSL and SPM. Um, the only reason I'm not focusing on AFNI is AFNI actually has algorithms that are SPM-like and FSL-like. So the MIMA algorithm, if you use that in um, AFNI, that most closely mirrors FSL. I'm actually a little curious. I think they might actually be the same. Um, just theoretically, they go down a different road to get to possibly the same place. The results are quite similar in the simulation, simulation studies that were reported in the paper. Anyway, so mostly focusing on FSL and SPM with the understanding that AFNI has these algorithms as well. So make sure you're ready. Um, you really need to have a good understanding of the two-stage summary statistics model and make sure you're comfortable with the math behind it because you'll start to get a little bit behind here or perhaps you won't fully understand um, the important distinction between these two models. So if you need to refresh your memory on any of these things, you can revisit either the two-stage summary statistics approach video or the how the two-stage model is estimated with fMRI video. So last time we looked at this, this two-stage model, where in the first stage we're modeling the fMRI time series. So this is a bold time series tipped on its side, and this is a design matrix for a block design study. And the important bits at the first level are this contrast we estimate. In this case, it's faces minus houses. And the within-subject variance has this somewhat complicated structure of a within-subject variance square term times a correlation matrix, which is how I'm expressing it here. You can also express it as a just a single covariance matrix C, but um, it just depends. Okay, so that's what you get out of this. This is your C beta hat, and then you take um, multiply this pre and post multiply that by C. And then at the second level, um, we have this model. Each of these, again, is the faces minus houses contrast for each subject. So we have about 10 subjects. And the group model is a one-sample t-test. So I'm using the one-sample t-test as an example. But the modeling strategies I'm showing you today can be used with any type of model. So I realize. Um, FSL and SPM, they just work basically with the general linear model. So as long as you can construct a design matrix, you can plug it in to their software. So all the design matrix setup lectures I went over were geared toward that type of setup. Whereas AFNI has different algorithms for different types of models. Um, from what I can tell, that's primarily because they use some of the estimation shortcuts using sums of squares um, to speed up their model estimation. Uh, for ANOVA type models, which is a pretty smart thing to do. It just means that with AFNI, it's more likely that you're going to have to use a different function depending on what model you're running. Um, so I'm not sure you do the contrast and design matrices the same way that we do them in FSL and SPM. Anyway, um, the model setup is the theory for all the models is exactly the same. And um, if we're using a two-stage summary statistics approach, the structure of the variance at the second level has this within subject component here, which is this is from level one. So this is your level one residual variance times, uh, yes, uh, this star here has the, the V built into it, which uh, you can revisit the last lecture to see that. X1 star transpose, X1 star C transpose. So this is the within subject contrast um, variance estimate. And then you add the between subject variance to that. So um, last time we talked about how this boils down to a weighted linear regression at stage two. So how do the software packages estimate this? So let me back up for a second. So it's actually kind of challenging um, to have the sum of two things. So at the second level, we know this, or at least we have an estimate for this first part, the within subject variance from level one. 
and we need to estimate a between subject variance. So it's a little tricky to do that, especially with something like a variance, which is uh, typically assumed to be positive. Uh, you may be thinking a uh, variance is always positive, Jeanette, but it turns out in some estimation um, settings, such as this one, sometimes you have to let it be negative. It, we don't, the fMRI software packages we use don't, but I've seen arguments to allow for it instead of restricting it to be zero. But anyway, or I'm sorry, to be uh, non-negative. So anyway, it's a tricky business. Um, estimating this such that the sum of these two things has to satisfy properties. So how do we estimate sigma squared g? That's the trickiest part. SPM doesn't. And you might be thinking, whoa, you know, SPM breaks all the rules. But they, they make a pretty simple set of assumptions, and it makes the estimation for the model super easy. Um, and so, of, of course, there are pros and cons to that. And FSL uses a Bayesian approach for estimating sigma squared g. You still end up with a p-value at the end of the day. It's just how the sigma parameter is estimated. So SPM, what's the magic? Well, it assumes a homogeneous variance across subjects. So I'll explain the math down here. In other words, it assumes everything about the first level of the design is the same across subjects. So the, in order for these values to be the same, the design matrices have to be the same for all subjects, the residual variance has to be the same for all subjects, and the temporal correlation matrix, which is buried in here, it's incorporated with the stars, that also is assumed to be the same for all subjects. So if these are all the same, then I can just replace all of these within subject variances with a single term, sigma hat within all. So this is just the overall within subject variance, which means the group covariance matrix VG is instead just sigma squared within all times the identity plus sigma squared G times the identity, which I can just express these are both unknown effectively, so it's just a single variance term times the identity. So let me back up. We assume this diagonal, everything's the same. If these are all the same, then we're just adding a diagonal matrix to a diagonal matrix, and we can just basically assume it's just equal to some diagonal matrix. So that's what this is. And what's awesome is then you can just use OLS. So basically, this group model is a one-sample t-test, um, which is really kind of cool. So one of the reasons I think this is really cool is because frequently when people run their own region of interest analyses, this is what they do. They just take their, their contrast estimates, average them over their ROI, and I'll talk more about that in a future lecture, and they run their model. You're actually doing, you're still running a mixed model when you do that, it just has this assumption that the within subject variances are all equal. So really cool, really simple. Just a one sample t-test. So if I was running an ANOVA at the group level, it'd just be a standard ANOVA. If I was running a uh, uh, simple linear regression, same as a simple linear regression or correlation. So that's cool. Uh, one cool thing that SPM allows you to do is if you bring multiple contrast for each subject to the group level, um, I don't know, what could this be? It could just be two different uh, tasks that they did. And let's say you're running a two sample t-test to compare those two stimuli to each other. Maybe your stimuli are correlated. Um, maybe there's something about them that's related. And so if you ever have a correlation, you have to count for it, just as we did for the temporal autocorrelation in our level one models. If we have two stimulus our contrast estimates that are correlated, and they're probably correlated simply because they're within subject, um, SPM can actually estimate covariances between your parameters at the group level. Um, and I don't, I don't know if AFNI can, FSL doesn't. It assumes an identity matrix here, so that's kind of cool. It is a global estimate, just as the temporal autocorrelation estimate is global. At the first level, this is global. So there are pros and cons to that. Oh, and I can back up. There is uh, a, a fancier way for accounting for repeated measures at the group level. And I will I will actually do a um, a whole lecture on this paper, maybe two, 
Oh boy. I hate to not give the first author credit, but I know Tom Nichols is on the paper and they use a sandwich estimator approach. And this is actually part of SPM2 or SPM2, SPM12. And by the way, this, this is SPM2 just showing my age. It, it holds for SPM12 uh, as well. The model's still the same. But anyway, the SWE library, I think, the sandwich estimator library, allows you to do something even fancier and more robust than this. And it also is a voxel-wise estimate. So more to come on that. So SPM2, 2, 2, 12, 5, 8, all the same. Um, you can have multiple contrasts per subject in the second level. The contrast can be correlated. So T tests and F tests, so tip, uh, standard or a proper F test are possible. And it's a special case. One contrast per subject reduces to a T test. So something we all know and love. Pros, easy to estimate. Models, easy to understand. Multiple contrasts can enter the group model and not be considered independent. Cons, a global covariance estimate, um, and also it assumes the variance is homogeneous across subjects. So I actually wrote a paper about that in two, I should know when this was published, 2009, I have a paper, I think it's called Simple Group Models or something like that. And we actually show that this SPM approach, the type one errors are fine. You just take a slight hit in power with the one sample t-test by assuming the variances are homogeneous if they are not. Okay, so FSL, the fMRI B software library, uses a Bayesian approach to estimating the model. Inferences are based on a posterior distribution, so it's focusing on the probability of the parameter values given the data, as usual, and the parameters of interest are treated as random. So the one simplification, this new G, the, these are the degrees of freedom. Uh, which can be actually rather challenging to estimate. So there are two versions of this routine, and one of them assumes these are what we normally assume, n minus p, and another one's fancier. Um, right, so those are flame one and flame two. So flame one uses a map estimate, a sigma squared g, which is found iteratively, um, and it speeds up the process by assuming the degrees of freedom are known. It's just the number of subjects minus the number of parameters in your model. Flame 2 is, uh, I believe, not recommended. Just stick with flame 1. It's a slower uh, MCMC method of estimation, and it's slow, so it's only applied to voxels that are close to the threshold in the first step, and it fine-tunes all of these estimates, including the degrees of freedom. So if something's not even close to being significant, there's no reason to fine tune the estimate. But again, since this is slow, um, and I believe I could be misquoting, I think there are some issues with it. Just stick with flame one. It's typically what are used. If you want the details, I invite you to read this Woolrich paper from 2004. Good one. So pros of FSL, when a single contrast is taken to the second level, it's equivalent, and it's almost equivalent, so there's a little wiggly before that, it's approximately equivalent to an all-in-one model. Um, the actual all-in-one model, remember, it iteratively estimates the betas and the, the variances back and forth, and here we're not doing that. We're not updating the, with, um, the beta estimate and then estimating um, all the variance terms. Um, the other pros within subject variances are carried to the second level. So last time I was telling you part of the cool things, one of the cool things about this model is that if you have heterogeneity, if you have a noisy subject, they get downweighted. Um, so that will happen here in FSL. In SPM, all the subjects are treated as equal, equally good subjects. Cons, multiple contrasts in the group model are assumed to be independent. There are certain things we can do, like a paired t-test that adjust for uh, within subject covariances, but if you have something rather complicated, it's not really set up for it. Again, for something like that, um, if you have a really complicated repeated measure structure, I recommend the, um, the sandwich estimator routine, which is only currently part of SPM. And again, if you want to do something like this in um, AFNI, you would use the MEMA algorithm. So if you are using MEMA, take care in how you run your first level models because you have to run, uh, I believe, the ones that do pre-whitening. So just look at the help for that. Which software FSL is better for heteroscedastic variances? So if you have really widely varying numbers of trials per subject, 
SPM is better for multiple correlated contrast. Um, again, I would use this new sandwich estimator routine. And uh, of course, other differences in first level modeling, modeling way sway users one way or another. And of course, if you're an AFNI, this would just sway you to choose one function over another. Um, ultimately, at the end of the day, it's probably what the lab you work in uses or what you sort of were raised on that you will use. Um, yeah. So make sure you have all that. Um, know the primary differences between FSL and SPM or something like the, what is it, T-test plus, 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 or whatever it is in, uh, in AFNI and MIMA, the differences between those. Thank you very much. Uh, please join the Facebook group if you haven't already. Uh, here's the path. You just go to Facebook slash group slash Mumford Brain Stats. And I hope you have a marvelous day.